So one major problem that design for testability has to deal with is the problem of observability and controllability of internal nodes. So we talked about this uh, briefly when we introduced design for testability, and the problem is specifically that internal nodes within the chip are not reachable. They're not reachable for direct control or for direct observation. We need to have direct control over them because if we need to test a specific module within the chip, we need to be able to control its inputs. We need to have direct observation on internal nodes because also if we are testing an internal module, then we need to be able to observe its outputs in order to make sure that it matches the gold standard or just to uh, try to figure out what kind of fault has occurred. So we need to have direct access to these nodes. The most direct way to do this, the most uh, naive way to do this is to just pull them out to additional pins. Now, the problem is, um, of course, pins are a very valuable resource on chips. Most chips nowadays are, are limited by their pins and not by their core. And therefore, we cannot really waste too many pins on pulling out internal nodes. But the bigger problem is, which nodes do you pull out? There are, you know, there's an infinitely large number, not infinitely, but there's a huge number of internal nodes. Um, it's really hard to figure out in advance which of them will be critical and which will not. So there has to be a more systematic way to, uh, to apply this. Uh, when we talked about how we can share pins so that we can increase controllability and increase observability without um, increasing pins too much, uh, we saw that the way to do this is to use multiplexes in order to uh, multiplex uh, in, uh, pins between test modes and normal modes. So we discussed this in the first video in the module, uh, but again, we didn't have a systematic way to do this. We did this for a specific internal module, uh, but we need to do it to, for all modules. We also need to discuss what is the level of granularity that we will be dealing with. Uh, specifically, which what do you mean by module? What do you mean by I need to provide observability and controllability to this module? What is a module? So the way to do to deal with this is something called the scan technique. And we are gonna uh, we're gonna discuss the building block of the scan technique, which is the scan register in this video, and then the technique as a whole in the next video. Uh, but the scan technique depends on the, uh, on the fact that the majority of our circuits are synchronous pipelines, which means that they contain combinational logic blocks uh, sandwiched between registers. So what you see here is a representation of a circuit which contains uh, uh, synchronous pipelines. Uh, these shaded uh, blocks are combinational logic blocks which could be one or more CMOS combinational logic gates, um, but they are the only thing that we, uh, the only condition that we impose upon them is that they are be they be purely combinational, and these white rectangles are uh, re registers. Um, in general, we assume that they are positive edge triggered registers. We're also assuming that these registers are multi-bit, meaning that these are not a single bit register, but uh, uh, have a large bus width, and which means that the inputs are applied in parallel to each of these uh, registers. So now the level of granularity that we will be dealing with is the level of the combinational logic block. We need to be able to provide uh, full controllability to the inputs of the CLB and full observability to the outputs of the CLB. What, Regardless of where that CLB is, if it's deep in the pipeline or if it is on the periphery, we need to provide controllability and observability to these particular nodes. In the situation shown here, they are not observable and controllable. They're not at least directly uh, observable or controllable. Uh, so the way to deal with this is to design something called a scan register. Once we design the scan register, what's going to happen is that we are going to replace every register in our design by a scan register. To be more specific, we will replace every single pipeline register in our design with a scan register. So 
this could be done manually, but it, it, it usually can be handled by the tool, by the CAT tool, so that the CAT tool knows to replace any um, declaration of a register in VHDL with a scan register instead. So how does a scan register differ from a normal register? Let's just look at a single bit register or a flip-flop first and then deal with a multi-bit multi -bit register. So this is a normal flip-flop and this is a scannable flip-flop. As you can see, the only additional hardware that we are using is a two input multiplexer. Since we are dealing with a single bit register, this is a very small two by one multiplexer. Uh, on the other hand, the IO ports of the uh, scannable register of the scannable flip-flop are a little bit more complicated than a normal flip-flop. So a normal flip-flop just has a, a, data, a data input D, a data output Q, and a clock. Uh, for the scannable flip-flop, we also have uh, three additional pins. These are specifically TDI, test, and TDO. TDI stands for test data in, TDO stands for test data out, and test is just a control pin that indicates whether or not we are in test mode. And so this scannable register or scannable flip-flop has two modes normal mode and test mode. So this depends on the situation of the test signal. If the test input signal is equal to zero, then we are in normal mode. If the test control input is equal to one, then we are in test mode. So with the test input equal to zero, the Input D, the external input D, is going to be uh, picked by the multiplexer and it's going to be fed to the input D of the um, normal flip-flop within, uh, within the scannable flip-flop. And the output is going to be read at Q. So in, in that case, the flip-flop reduces to the original flip-flop. We are bypassing any sort of weirdness that has to do with testing. On the other hand, with test equal to 1, we pick the input TDI and pass it to the input D. And we also, and this is not something that you can see here, but we are also going to look at the output TDO. So it looks like the difference between the scannable flip-flop in test mode and in normal mode is just that we are picking TDI uh, for uh, when, when test mode is equal to 1 and we're picking D when test mode is equal to zero. And this is true. The only thing about uh, the scannable flip-flop is that it can pick between two inputs, uh, the input TDI and the input D. So its output can be either or. It can be either TDI or uh, D, and the way we pick is through the mode signal test. So that's a very minor difference. It's also a very minor hardware cost. The 2 by one multiplexer is not huge, and it's not a, a significant hardware cost. But as we will see in the next video, when you take this and apply it to a big register and um, apply a certain test algorithm, this gives you incredible controllability and observability on your circuit.